Our approach to fighting climate change has not been working. I see this every day in my work as a climate change policy analyst. Instead of converting our entire energy system over to renewables, we need to use a lot less energy. That means climate change policy should focus on building neighborhoods that let us use a lot less energy. In my work at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, we've been doing research into urban planning and reducing emissions. Now, this is pretty unusual in climate change policy. Most climate change policy is not written by climate change experts. It's not written by urban planners. It's not even written by environmentalists. It's written by economists. How economists have framed our fight against climate change is they take our current energy system and then they run it through a computer that spits out an emissions reductions plan for us. Let me explain why this is a problem by using an analogy. Imagine there was someone trying to get into shape. Instead of going to a fitness trainer, they go to an economist who promises them a net zero calories plan. <laughs> they explain, every day they eat 20 pizzas, they drink 20 liters of pop, they eat 20 boxes of donuts. The economist adds up the total amount of calories, runs it through a computer, which then spits out a net zero plan. This person has to, every day, jog for 100 kilometers, do 5,000 push-ups, and 5,000 jumping jacks. This is exactly what climate change policy looks like today. Governments, instead of going to climate change experts or urban planners or even environmentalists, they go to economists who give them these net zero plans. The government explains how the energy system works. Let's start with transportation. Each individual in our society is entitled to drive around a 3,000 pound machine everywhere they go, to go to work, to go to school, everything. The amount of energy it takes to give each individual in our society their own 3,000 pound car is ludicrous. First, we have to collect all the materials. We have to build the car. We have to pave over our land. Then we have to fuel the car. And even if it's an electric vehicle, we have to mine the minerals, refine them, ship them around the world, build the car, pave the land, and still somehow generate enough electricity to fuel these things. So the economist adds up the total amount of energy, they run it through a computer program, which then spits out these net zero plans. They tell us, we have to make 20 bajillion solar panels. We have to mine 50 bajillion tons of lithium and copper for batteries. This approach just doesn't work. For the same reason you don't get an economist to write your fitness strategy, you don't get an economist to write your climate action plan. Now, many of you can probably guess why this approach doesn't really work. First of all, clean energy isn't entirely clean. It has all sorts of social and environmental impacts. Take hydro, for example. Hydro is one of our most productive sources of renewable energy. But all around the world, giant hydro dams have devastated ecosystems and ruined nearby communities who depend on those rivers for their livelihoods. Or take mining for batteries. Mining has all sorts of environmental impacts and also relies really heavily on the fossil fuel industry. Probably the most serious problem with this kind of calculator net zero approach is that it always relies really heavily on carbon capture and storage, or CCS. CCS is a technology that sucks carbon out of the air and pumps it into the ground. Wouldn't that be amazing? The only problem with it is that it doesn't actually work. After decades of development, there's a few dozen of these facilities around the world, capturing such a tiny amount of carbon that you can't even see it on a graph. If you read through net zero reports, you find economists like to use a lot of wishy-washy language around carbon capture and storage. In many places, they just write, we're hoping scientists will invent this in the future. I'm wondering if any of you can do this in your jobs. You just write, scientists will invent this later. <laughs> this is a core part of how climate change policy works today. I mean, we're talking about climate change. We're talking about potential collapse scenarios that'll happen in our lifetimes. We've put economists in charge. Their plan so far is to mine our way out of the crisis and hope scientists invent technology to suck carbon out of the air. Perhaps you can get a sense of frustration in my tone here. In many ways, economists have poisoned climate change policy. We need a more intelligent approach. And the answer is a lot more straightforward than you might think. We need to build neighborhoods that let us use a lot less energy. Picture a classic North American suburb one with wide roads and lots of single-family homes. 
I've spent so much of my life in places like this. There are no sidewalks. There's no bike lanes. There's no functioning public transportation system. There's no stores, shops, or offices within walking distance. There's no food system in sight. It takes so much energy to live in this kind of place, this car-oriented place, where people are so isolated from all the things they need. We will never be able to generate enough renewables to cover the energy demand here. If we care about climate change, these neighborhoods have to be redesigned. By the numbers, we know that suburban developments use at least twice as many emissions compared to more compact livable communities. European countries, for example, where livable communities are a lot more common, produce 50% fewer emissions compared to us here in North America. 50%. You have to understand how massive this is. We're not getting anywhere remotely close to 50% with our calculator, let's just switch it all to renewables approach. Actually, our emissions are going up. They're not going down. What this tells us is that redesigning our communities is actually more important than switching to renewables. Picture that same neighborhood again. Imagine we added in a public square with maybe a grocery store and some small shops and a common space where you can just kind of hang out after work. Imagine we turned a giant parking lot into an athletic space or small-scale agriculture or really any productive space. Studies consistently tell us that people living in livable communities are healthier and happier. We could actually make your life better this way. But nobody in climate change policy thinks this way. Sustainable neighborhood design can't be found in any mainstream climate change policy. It's not in net zero frameworks. It's not in renewable energy investments. Right now, all the work around sustainable neighborhood design is being done by a small handful of urban planners and community groups. These people get almost no funding. While the electric vehicle industry, for example, will get enormous amounts of climate change funding, urban planners get the equivalent of pocket change from our small local governments. After 30 years of climate change policy, our emissions are higher today than when we started. Clearly, there's something very deeply structurally broken with how we're approaching climate change. Right now, we use energy thoughtlessly. We consume extreme amounts of energy for every little thing. We drive when we could walk. We import food from around the world when we could be supporting our farmers right here. The truth of the matter is, if we redesign our neighborhoods, we could cut out the majority of energy use and it would make our lives better. Every time I walk past the parking lot, I can't help but think about how much more beautiful our communities could be. I think about all the connections and the relationships that we're missing out on. This is how you fight climate change, by redesigning our communities and using a lot less energy.